will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead? Good morning. It's great to see you this morning. The subject of SES, socioeconomic status, has captured the attention of many Singaporeans this week. A uh, number of people sent me some posts on WhatsApps. Apparently, someone posted on Facebook about a local social studies O-level guide, and it highlighted several distinguishing features of high SES and low SES. Colloquially, we'll call that rich and poor. If you belong to the higher socioeconomic status, the book said you could possibly use formal English in daily conversation or at home, play sports or tennis at an exclusive country club, have regular fine dining at expensive restaurants, and travel overseas for leisure during school holidays. If you belong to the other end of the lower socioeconomic status, the book said you could possibly use Singlish or different dialects in daily conversation or at home, play football or basketball in HDB estates, eat at hawker centres or at home, work part-time jobs during vacation time to meet basic family needs. Obviously, many people didn't like the determining choices that were highlighted and felt that these were too broad a sweep. As a result, in the age of social media, you get basically news feeds and buzz that results in even folks like Scoot picking up the media trend and reversing the hype for marketing purposes. The concept of SES, or socioeconomic status, is not new. I mean, it is a tool that is used by governments around the world for, for planning purposes. That's why it's part of social studies. But when one speaks about the topic of rich and poor and choices and outcomes in life being dependent or influenced on one's SES, that naturally becomes a highly sensitive issue. Against that backdrop, we consider today the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Now, this message was planned since last year. Our messages for the NTC are planned fully. So in advance, by at least six months, the whole year of the NTC messages, titles and texts are planned. So I didn't deliberately try to capture the buzz of the week or the flavor of the week it is God's providence that the subject of SES captures a sensitive part of us. And it also operates in this rather difficult account in Scripture. Why difficult? Because to many people, it just doesn't make sense. The parable, the account, appears to be just a simple reversal. Rich man who was rich goes to hell. Poor man who was poor goes to heaven. Someone was quoted as saying this, live life well and in hell. Suffer pain and joy great gain. But is this what Jesus is teaching? Simple reversal. Kind of be poor and go to heaven philosophy. We think about that at doesn't really make sense. It doesn't match up with the biblical evidence. I think of characters like Abraham and Job and Solomon and Philemon, and well, Solomon in his earlier life at least. And they were all rich. They all lived well in this life. They were all godly men, as I said, Solomon in his earlier years. And I believe they're all in heaven. If you look at Proverbs, on the other hand, that book tells us some people, not all, some people are poor because they are lazy. So I don't think it's as simple as, well, the rich go to hell and the poor go to heaven paradigm. You say, Pastor, what, what then is this parable or this account about Last week, I reminded you that a parable is a story that places one thing, an earthly story, that places one thing beside another for the purpose of teaching. And you say, ah, but pastor, is this account a parable? After all, it didn't begin 
with Luke saying, and Jesus told them a parable. It just began with the words, a certain man. Is it then a historical account and not a parable? Well, let's think about that. The parable of the Good Samaritan began the same way. A certain man went from this place to that. Luke didn't preface it with Jesus told them a parable. This, a certain man, a certain rich man, appears to be a hypothetical story. Jesus is teaching a lesson through the comparison of a hypothetical situation for the purpose of illustrating truth. So just like the parable that we learned last week of the prodigal son or the lost son, the story is based on what could hypothetically happen. So although Luke doesn't begin with the words, now Jesus began to tell them a parable, we say quite confidently that Jesus is telling a story that places one thing beside another for the purpose of teaching. It would not be wrong to call this account parabolic, and therefore we can apply the rules of parables. Last week, I reminded you, rule number one, look for the key spiritual truth. Don't go for the details to spiritualize people and places. Don't try to correlate one for one in the early story to a, to a heavenly person or thing. Because for the most part, parables are stories designed to make one main point. You understand the point, you understand the parable. So last week, we said the story is a response to individuals who are like the older brother. Start seeing your hypocrisy, arrogance, and lack of understanding of salvation. And we said, here's the bad news. You're not the prodigal son. You're the older brother. Stop pointing figures. Look at your own heart. The mistakes of hypocrisy, self-entitlement, self-righteousness, ingratitude, and pride. We round it up with what many people think is the key verse in the Gospel of Luke. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He said this immediately after the account of the short tax collector Zacchaeus repenting, showing fruits of repentance, believing in Jesus. And we read all that this past week in our New Testament challenge. But there's another rule that I've taught you before. And we need to understand the earthly story of the parable in the context of Jesus' time and teaching. The earthly story is not set in modern Singapore. It's set in the time of Jesus. In order to discern the key spiritual truth, we need to understand the story in its original context of time. What was Jesus teaching at that time? What was he specifically addressing? Who was he specifically addressing? How was he specifically addressing it? Why was he addressing that? We look for contextual clues, and that gives us a better view of what the parable really means. Question, what was Jesus teaching just before he told this story of Lazarus and the rich man? We read it this past week in the same chapter. He cited a universal principle. He said, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. This is a universal principle. It is entirely logical. You can't have two ultimate allegiances. Now, you can have relative allegiances. You can prefer one thing over another. But if one conflicts with the other, one must prevail. Jesus used the example of money. He says, well, you can't serve both God and money. There is only one ultimate allegiance. Covetousness is idolatry. What you want the most becomes God for you. This was the context of what Jesus was teaching. That's the subject. Now, who was Jesus speaking to when he told this parable? Look at the text. It's there. The Pharisees also who were covered just heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, 
What was in the Pharisees' mind? Well, it tells us they were covetous. And they heard all these things and they, this guy from Galilee, carpenter's son, what does he know? Got no money so he can say what he likes about rich people. I mean, he can say bad things about those with money because he doesn't have money himself. Right? I mean, we who are more blessed with the stewardship of more resources, we know what it's like. We will see it differently. And Jesus said unto them, who is he speaking to? The Pharisees. This is where I will guide you a little, the subdivisions in your Bible, whether ESV, NAS, New King James or King James, four versions that we say are good, please use. Sometimes the subdivisions distract you from the subject and the object. Who Jesus is speaking to, because they have a little header that goes in between and you miss the fact that Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, you see a different subject, and then you see Lazarus and the rich man, and you wonder, oh, I forgot who he was speaking to. You need to go backwards. The headings, the subtitles, the verses and chapters, they weren't there in the original text, yeah? So you can ignore those as you look back for the contextual clues. Who did he speak to? He was speaking to the Pharisees. There was no change in audience between verse 14 to verse 19. What, who, why? Why did he tell this parable? He said to them, you are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. But that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. That word, justify yourselves. That reflects one of the themes that the Gospel of Luke draws out very clearly. The theme of self-justification. Say, Pastor, show me. We remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. It was a certain lawyer. Yeah, lawyer again. He stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He was testing Jesus. And Jesus answered the question with the question, what's written in the law? I mean, you're a lawyer. How do you read the law? And he answered and said, Well, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and neighbor as thyself. I mean, he gave a great answer. Brilliant. Jesus said unto him, I was answered right. Well, don't just know it. Go do it. And thou shalt live. But this guy was not really very satisfied. He wanted to justify himself. He wanted to say, come on, are you saying I'm not doing this? And he said to Jesus, so who's my neighbor? And Jesus knew this. Jesus knew he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to say, I'm good enough. Are you telling me I'm not good enough? And Jesus tells him the parable of the Good Samaritan. And sometimes we think the parable of the Good Samaritan is just to, you know, you, you have to show love, just like love others as yourself. Yes. But in context, I preached on this before, the point that Jesus was making is that the bar is not set where you think it's set. The bar is set really, really high. I mean, the Good Samaritan, he crosses culture. The Jews didn't like the Samaritan. He gives up his time, his money, his energy. I mean, the priest walks by and doesn't do anything. The Levite walks by and doesn't do anything. But this guy, in the middle of the highway, in danger of bandits, an enemy of the Jews, a half-blooded Samaritan, he crosses culture. He helps an enemy by bandaging his wounds, caring for him, putting him on his own donkey, bringing him to an inn, telling the innkeeper, please take care of him, I pay you. He owes you whatever he owes, I'll pay. He said, whoa, you mean the standard of loving my neighbor is that high? Yeah, stop justifying yourself. You haven't loved God and your neighbor enough. Self-justification is carried through to Luke 18, where Jesus told them this parable unto certain men which trusted in themselves, and they were righteous and despised others. Famous parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican, tax collector. 
Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee. Many people, you know, with the King James, I thank thee and coffee. No, no, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give thighs of all that I possess. Now, if you think about it, what the Pharisee said was, strictly speaking, probably true. I don't think he was lying. You know, I think he did fast regularly. I think he did give thighs. I mean, he wasn't the kind of person who was getting drunk or sleeping around or taking drugs. I, I don't think he was lying. But this was all done. This prayer was prayed within a framework of the justification of self. A line of thinking is very much like the elder brother in the parable of the lost son. You know, I'm not like the other crap in society. I'm a member of, you know, PPCC, good church. I give a lot of money to the church. I'm the good guy. And perhaps you and I enter into self-justification and forget that it is God that justifies. Who does God justify? And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I tell you all that on the theme of self-justification just to come back to Luke 16, 15, the contextual clue, and he's speaking about this theme. You are they which justify yourselves before men. Now, in this case, they think they are better than Jesus because they have more money. But God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. This is ironic. It is what people value the most that is detestable in God's sight. And you say, hey, why? Why should what we consider good be what God hates? The answer is not in the substance. The answer is in the value that we place on it. I say that again. The answer is not in the substance. There's nothing wrong with money itself, jobs itself, position itself. But it is the value that we place on it so highly, ultimate allegiance, that it becomes an idol. And idolatry is detestable in the sight of God. This is a question of ultimate allegiance because when your ultimate allegiance is placed in something that is not the creator, sovereign God, when your ultimate allegiance is when you cannot serve both God and money or position or job or family or children, it is then that what we highly esteem becomes abomination in the sight of God himself. In the context, Jesus was talking about the subject of money. Now, probably nobody here will say it outright. If I have more money, I'm a better person. That's what the Pharisees were saying in their hearts. This guy got no money. He doesn't know how to teach. Well, let me tell you what. Let's consider a perfectly legitimate example that we have. We are proven in Singapore to be the country with the highest cost of vehicles. Okay, proven worldwide, highest cost of cars. And I used this example last week, and I have to be careful because last week one of our guys came down the stairs and he says, Pastor, I drive a Lexus, so I've got to be careful <laughs> because I used Lexus as an example last week. Well, okay, I'll differentiate you, okay? Today's example is also about Lexus, but okay. Say you drive a new Lexus. So you're out, okay? You didn't drive a new one. <laughs> say you drive a new Lexus, and you arrive at a traffic light. You pull up, traffic light's red. And you go, and your car's nice and smooth. And I drive up in an old, noisy, our old church van. <laughs> now, which would be more highly esteemed among men? 
Yeah, I, I think if we're honest, we'll say the natural tendency, new Lexus, better. But that's not the problem. Substance itself is not the problem. The problem is when the traffic light turns green. And when you pull away the new Lexus and the engine hums so smoothly, and you know, almost like no sound, mm, and you go off and the old grey van's left behind, and you think, wow, I feel so good because I'm superior driving this new Lexus. The feeling that I am better because I have this. And it can be anything that makes me feel that I am better. It could be clothes, you know, whatever, whether it's supreme as a label that you wear, or whether it's the one with the two X's, or whether it's the one that's, you know, with the, with the ape Japanese brand. It could be your job or position that you, you hold. It could be your house. It could be your family. It could be, oh, I've got two great kids. And you, you kind of, I feel a bit better, you know, than that other person. And you start justifying yourself. I'm better. Because the ultimate allegiance has shifted. As a connection between the ultimate allegiance and the way our heart operates in self-justification. You say, Pastor, nobody does that. Lah. In modern Singapore, nobody is going to say, I'm rich, so I can do this or that. Really? I'll give an example just this week. High SES woman hawks family parking lot sites. I got money to burn as reason. Driving what looks like a mini convertible, she was confronted when she allegedly took the family parking lot at Jurong Point. When asked to explain why she did so, she said that she had money to burn and that everybody knows that she has three cars. She even brandishes a chain of what looks to be khakis to prove the point accompanied with a nod. Okay, so I've given you the giphy so that you can see that. Uh, it was posted by someone named Daniel Chu. So I was thinking, Daniel Chu. <laughs> Jurong West. Okay, uh, no, it's not him. Okay, it's not him. One would say, hmm, don't think very highly of that woman. Let's look at the contrast that the Savior gives. Jesus was born in a manger. There was no room for him in the inn. Lowly shepherds were chosen as messengers. He grew up a carpenter's son. He said, foxes have holes and birds have nets, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know, Jesus was fully divine and he was fully human. And as he has, just wasn't the important thing to him. I say, Pastor, you're going back to your reversal, right? Poor people go to heaven and rich people go to hell. No, 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 no. I'm just giving you all the contextual clues. Final one, final one. One more contextual clue before we jump into the parable. And this is what people miss, because this involves a reading of the whole of Luke. Okay. Luke 9.51 says, It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. This is Jesus. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is a very interesting verse. In fact, it shapes the rest of the Gospel of Luke. It's one of the organizing principles of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, some people call Luke a travel narrative. In chapter 9, barely one-third into the book, Luke records that Jesus sets his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. Now, other Gospels report this back-and-forth trips kind of thing, but Luke says from here on, Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. And this is not the only time Luke states this. He says this several times in the book. So it's important. What does he mean? He says Jesus is setting himself to move forward. And, and Jerusalem means something different from his disciples. Jerusalem means, oh, he's going to be king, Messiah. No. For Jesus, he's setting himself towards his death and resurrection and ascension. 
said, Master, what's the point? The point is Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem when he told this parable. He had set his face directly towards the cross. And therefore, the cross is going to be the dividing line between those who are justified and those who are not. It is not riches or the relative lack of it. It is the cross that is the dividing line. You cannot justify yourself. You cannot divide your ultimate allegiance to depend on something else. It is the cross of Jesus Christ that's going to be dividing line in this story between the rich man and the poor man, not there as yes, but the cross of Jesus Christ. And so then we come back full circle and consider it from a literary point of view and consider that there's a trilogy of wastage in the three parables that are told one at a time, recorded together. Luke 15, last parable, lost son. Luke 16, first parable, dishonest servant. And then, parable of the rich man. All of these parables have to do with money. Luke 15, prodigal son wasted his father's possessions. Luke 16, this honest servant wastes his master's possessions. And now we come to the parable of the rich man and he wastes his own possessions. Or is it really his own? So it's got something to do with the wastage of self-indulgence. Quite clearly, there's a trilogy here. And so, with all of those contextual clues, rule number two, look at what Jesus is teaching, who, what, why, how. Let's jump into this parable. There was a certain man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously. He lived in celebration luxury every day. Purple was a royal color. Some people think snails, peculiar, important kind of rare snails were used to dye clothing into purple. These were the types that you could not buy for, you know, maybe less than $1,000 in our, in our currency. These were the, the high-class clothes. The, the, the kings wore purple. A striking luxury. Okay, uh, I mean, I think Supreme maybe goes for maybe the lowest T-shirt is $300, maybe. Higher than that, okay? Fine linen. Now, you, you don't wear fine linen unless you're filthy rich. You know why? Because the word for fine linen is also the word for underwear. So it's kind of like Jesus saying, in a twinkle in his eye, if you're interested, even his underwear was expensive. So this was beyond good quality. This was wearing clothing because I can. All right? He fared sumptuously. Now that word, we've seen it before in the parable of the lost son. When the prodigal son came back, the father said, let's kill the fatted calf and let's celebrate with a feast. That's the word. Let's, let's celebrate with the luxury because my son came back. Okay, well, this guy does it every day. I mean, he has a celebration feast every single day. The word is designed not for the everyday meal, for special occasions, but this guy... Because I can, let's live in celebration luxury. He doesn't spare anything in self-indulgence. I mean, imagine how much can a person eat? If one fatted calf can, can feed all the guests. I mean, how much waste is going there? But then we notice something about this man. He's rich. He's rich enough to, I don't care, I can wear purple and fine linen. I can live in celebration luxury every day. There's something about this man that is special because in Jewish culture, in the context, important people are named. This rich man was not given a name in the story. So he's rich, but he's not that important. The important guy, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And that that, that name Lazarus is significant. The name Lazarus is 
the one whom God helps. I mean, what a beautiful name. What we think almost immediately in our mind, if this is the one whom God helps, well, pity the one whom God doesn't help. Because this is a guy who's full of sores, which indicates he's sick. I mean, he's got some kind of disease. And in those times, there was no ER. There was no A&E. There was no hospice. Probably primitive health service. There were doctors. There were some charlatans as well. But no real health services to boot. No, no real dedicated health services you could, you could send people to. And, and God, in His grace, according to His law, had prescribed that community would help. A very community-based effort. Those who could were expected to do their part. Those who had more were expected to take care of the widows and the orphans. So even in the barley harvest, you don't reap all your barley, you leave some for the widows and orphans to take. This was a very rich man. He lives in a very big house. He has very fine clothes, and he eats very celebration luxury meals. They dropped him at his gate because there was an expectation that the beggar would be given something. This is according to Jewish law. This is according to community rules. This is the expected context. The phrase, desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, it reminds us of an account of the Syrophoenician woman. There was a Syrophoenician, she was not a Jew, and a child had a problem, and she came to beg Jesus. She said, Jesus, you've got to help me. Please heal my child. And Jesus said something very offensive. He says, I, I came to minister to the lost sheep of Israel, not to the dogs. But she was a Gentile. And what did she say? Remember what she said? She said, Lord, e even, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off of the table? Lazarus just wanted some leftover food. That was all he wanted. And the full phrase is unpacked when we introduce ourselves to the dogs, right? Because even the dogs get to eat the food from the rich man's table. Now, when you think of dogs, I know there are many people here who have lovely dogs. I, some of you put your dog there for this year's Chinese New Year because it's, it's the year. Yeah, so... Now, when you think of dog in this sense, don't think of your nice Labrador, Labradoodle, cuddly Chihuahua thing. No, it's not that. Okay. In that Jewish community, dogs were unclean. No pet dogs. These are either stray dogs or possibly, possibly something, work dogs, maybe guard dogs, maybe. Gated community, maybe guard dogs. But they were not your, your nice little cuddly labradoodle thing. No. These were, if, if, you think, if you think Australian dingo, if you think hyena, okay. Dogs, which were guard dogs, they weren't fed from your pet mart. There was no pet mart. Okay, you don't go buy canned food for the dogs. What do you do? You take scraps from whatever is available. I mean, after you finish your meal, you pack the scraps, you give it to the, to the guard dog, you throw it there, eat. That's what Lazarus wanted to eat. And it's not recorded that he was given any. It says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. That made him ceremonially unclean. I mean, it's... He was already physically unwell. Now he's ceremonially unclean. Nobody cares about him. Only the dogs touch him. And the point is, in the contrast that we see, the rich man who can afford anything does nothing to help Lazarus. Lazarus suffers alone and in silence. That's the contrast. But then here we have the reversal. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. 
and in hell he lived up his eyes, being in torments. This is what gives many people a puzzle in their minds. Is this the reversal of the rich go to hell and the poor go to heaven? No, that's not the point. Remember, the dividing line is the cross, the cross of Christ. And that's illustrated by the behavior of the rich man. He clearly did not fear God. If he did, he would have listened to the Jewish laws. They both died. The beggar, no record of burial, maybe thrown into the common grave, if, if at all. But he was carried by the angels to the side of Judaism's patriarch. You know, it's symbolic. Abraham. Abraham, our father. Into Abraham's bosom. Now, this phrase is often misunderstood. You read the commentaries, and you read some weird, really weird interpretations of this phrase or where it is. I mean, okay. This phrase is best understood when you think of the picture of the Last Supper. You know, in many houses, sometimes you go and you have this picture of the Last Supper with Jesus and his disciples. And, and there's always one person next to Jesus, and sometimes he's, you know, not depicted in the right way, but his name is John, a beloved disciple. And Jesus said at me, one of you is going to betray me. And immediately the murmurs, you can hear murmurs around, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. Now, what, what is common at those feasts is the posture that people, you, you're not sitting on chairs like here in Singapore. There's a table, which is a common table, and you're all reclining with one arm on the floor, reclining on the table, okay, and picking food from the common table. You're all on your side, you're all sitting on the floor, you're all kind of like lying down, reclining. So obviously, you're reclining one after the other. So if John is next to Jesus, what will happen? Jesus is behind him, John is reclining. Okay? So, John, ask Jesus, who's the one who's going to betray him? What does John have to do? I mean, Jesus is behind. John has to, he has to kind of lean back and put his head on Jesus' uh, chest. Hey, Jesus, what are you saying? What are you talking about? That, that was perfectly acceptable behavior in that time. Now, in today's time, you may not put your head on my chest. <laughs> now, the, we understand this, that different cultures have different norms. Sometimes you see uh, one of our Bangladeshi uh, foreign friends, and he will come to our church when he's on his off day. And, and how do I greet him? Some of you have commented on this. I, I give him a traditional Bangladeshi greeting. I, I, we, we do a three-way right, hug. Now, in that context, uh, in, in a Muslim world, it'd be three kisses. Three kisses on the cheek. Okay. In some parts of the world, there's no problem walking down the street, you know, with two guys hand in hand. You do that in Singapore, there's a problem, I think. <laughs> now, only my wife can hold my hand. Okay, so don't, please don't hold my hand. Now, but this is a perfectly acceptable kind of position of closeness. It's just closeness, proximity, and closeness to, to speak. The picture we have here is Lazarus in an intimate, close position with Abraham. I mean, if you like, symbolically, he's like in the best place, the closest place to Abraham's patron. Ah, Jewish patron, Abraham. It says a rich man also died and was buried. It's probably a grand funeral. You know, the type where lots of noise and lots of fanfare. But he goes to Hades and he finds himself in torment. And somehow we are told, we're not told how, but Jesus just tells us the story. He can see Abraham afar off and Lazarus next to him in his bosom. And what does he say? He cried out loud and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. Cool my tongue, for I tormented in this flame. <coughs> that was a real cough. Okay. <laughs> so he sees Abraham afar off. Okay. Lazarus close to him. And here's this dialogue. This is a portion where, of the parable where there's incredible dialogue. Why is it incredible? Pastor, what's so incredible? It's astonishing. 
because it records dialogue between the rich man and Abraham. One would have thought rich man Lazarus, reversal rich man Lazarus, dialogue rich man Lazarus. There's no dialogue with Lazarus. The rich man does not speak to Lazarus. He ignores him. He ignored him on earth. He ignores him in hell. Could I even suggest perhaps that he still has this I'm better than you syndrome? If you were the rich man, I mean, and you knew under law, you're supposed to take care of this guy at your gate, you see him every day, all right? And you throw food, you tell the servants to throw your scraps to the dogs and you don't give anything to him. I mean, now he's in heaven and you're on earth. What will you do? Sorry, you're, you're in hell, right? What will you do? I mean, what will you say? I mean, minimum is, hey, Lazarus, I'm, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I've been really selfish. I should at least, at least have cared for you. But nothing about that. I mean, there is, simply put, there is no repentance. There is no direct address to Lazarus. He calls out only to Abraham and he plays the race card. Father Abraham, I'm a Jew too. Have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. Huh? Wow, Lazarus became an errand boy. Send Lazarus, send Lazarus. So that he can dip his finger and then cool my tongue, make me comfortable. Ooh. I mean, the rich man refuses to show any mercy to Lazarus on earth. He totally ignores him, and now he demands service from someone he wouldn't even give dog food. And here's still not a single apology. A rich man in hell who cannot imagine giving up his self importance and his self justification. I'm better because I'm rich. The dialogue continues with Abraham's reply. He says, son, okay, well, you're a Jew, son. Remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things and likewise Lazarus' evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And we read this in the context, not just as a direct reversal, because in the clues that we've been given, we understand the rich man's problem. Abraham saying, this is justice. This is justice. Who was your allegiance to when you, were, when you were on earth? Did you obey God? And where was your mercy? You were self-justified, self-indulgent. The last verse here, you know, he's on the right side of the cross. And yes, he suffered on earth, and you didn't help. But now he's comforted, and you are tormented. This is justice, Abraham said. Reason number two, besides all this, you know, there's this reality. There's a great distance, a great gulf fix, so that they who want to come to you cannot do that. And you who want to pass to us also cannot. Now, it's phrased a little bit strangely. Say, Pastor, why is this so strange? Who in... Abraham's bosom will want to go down to Hades. <laughs> I mean, really, it, but that's what Abraham says. Those from hence who want to come to you cannot do I picture Lazarus, who in this story, I believe, is on the right side of the cross. And that says the context of it. And he's actually prepared. He say, okay, never mind. Let me help him. I, I can go. Wow. But there is no second chance. And today the truth remains that there is no second chance theology in the Bible. And so knowing the consequences, knowing the terror of the Lord, Paul says, we persuade men. There is no second chance if you're sitting here and you're on the wrong side of the cross, if your allegiance is in the wrong place and you're living for yourself or XXXXX thing then you're living to die. You want to live so that you might live. There is no second chance. Abraham says, no, you can't. 
And then the rich man says, okay, well, okay, well, I, I beg you, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, because I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of tor torment. And Abraham said to him, they are Moses and the prophets, let them hear him. The rich man said, hey, look, look, please, if Lazarus cannot be a table waiter to bring me water, make him an errand boy to warn my family. You know, make him a messenger to warn my family. I mean, come on, man. This rich man is not really repenting. Now, he's concerned about his family. Still, he's got the self-entitled St. Lazarus. What does Abraham say? Abraham says, no. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And what does the rich man do? He argues with Abraham. <laughs> he argues theology, you know. He says, no, 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 Father Abraham, you're wrong, you're wrong. If one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. Self-justification to the point that you're trying to argue theology with the patriarch, if you like. <laughs> Abraham's reply, look, if, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be persuaded the one rose from the dead. And that phrase has special significance to us and to Luke because Luke writes this on the side of the cross where Jesus has risen. Luke is writing this years after Jesus spoke this parable, after he died, and yes, after he rose from the dead, and still yet many had not believed. Many were not persuaded. And today I ask you, are you a believer? Are you persuaded? Because this story is a response to people who are like the rich man. It's told to complaining Pharisees. They complain about Jesus eating with social outcasts. They ridicule his teaching about the appropriate use of stewardship of money. They neglected the poor. They disregarded the will of God so clearly expressed in the law and the prophets. They justified themselves. They say, I'm better. I'm follower of God. But their ultimate allegiance was not to Yahweh. And we say, yeah, pastor, Pharisees are like that. And we convince ourselves, I'm not like that, I'm Lazarus. I'm the nice guy on the right side of the cross. The sad news is that this parable is written as a response to people who are like the rich man. And you and I, here's the bad news, you and I better start seeing ourselves like the rich man. Start thinking about your ultimate allegiance. It is not the reversal that's the problem. It's the fact that the rich man, ultimately his allegiance was to himself and his money. You cannot serve both God and money. Is our allegiance to King Jesus? Is it? Is our allegiance to the one who gave himself to die for our sins and rose again? I mean, this story tells us as a poor, wretched beggar saved by grace, now in the arms of the patriarchs in comfort. But the story also tells us there is a hell. It's surprising that Jesus talks more bluntly about hell than any other person. It's a place of torment. It's a place to run away from. Where is your ultimate allegiance? You say, Pastor, I said a prayer, I'm going to heaven. Mm, 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 mm. We call ourselves disciples of Christ, discipleship matters, right? And yet sometimes we find ourselves focusing so much on our children, our jobs, our money, our SES. Listen to the words of Jesus. No man can serve two masters. You either serve the one and hate the other or you cling to the one and hold to the other. You cannot serve both God and whatever it is. Avoid self-indulgence at the expense of others. <clears throat> the rich man was consumed with his own joy, his own leisure, his own celebration. He failed to respond to the suffering and need of others around him. There's a lot of self-indulgence in our society today. There's a lot of wastage, all right? There's a lot of attitude that resources belong to me. I can do whatever I want. Because I can. Never mind if I waste it. Who cares? Brothers and sisters, resources are entrusted to us as stewards. The trilogy of wastage reminds us 
that resources belong to God. How we use them is critical. And yes, we live in Singapore where we have plenty. And yes, we enjoy the fruit of our labor. And there's nothing wrong with the substance, remember? There's nothing wrong with the holiday. There's nothing wrong with the food. There's nothing wrong with the job. There's nothing wrong with the position. But there's a point at which some of us may have stopped caring for other people. You say, Pastor, that's me. I cared about myself. Well, then how do I begin? I mean, do I just give to charity? Is that what it is? No. Nope. Look at the opportunities God gives to you. I mean, the rich man saw Lazarus at his gate every day. Who's at your gate? Is it your family? Your extended family? Is it someone that God brings across your path directly? That you could say, I care. Because the law of God commands me to love my neighbor as myself. Jesus says, the Son of Man, I didn't come to be a king messiah on earth. I suffer many things. I'm going to be rejected of the elders, chief priests, and scribes. I'm going to be slain and be raised the third day. And he said to them all, if anyone wants to have anything to do with me, you want to follow me? Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will lose, save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage? If he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away. And yes, brothers and sisters, you should do the best you can with all of your investments and all of your wise decisions to, to make the most of the resources that God has given to you. But somewhere along the line, I fear that in our self-indulgent society, we do it at the expense of caring for others. And if you're honest with your own heart, you say, yeah, pastor, that's true. Today I ask you, who is the Lazarus at your gate? Who is the one God placed in your path? It could be anyone. And finally, reject self-justification based on personal opinion. You know, we find our identity sometimes in our own views of justification. We feel good about ourselves because we don't recognize the truth. I'm okay. Well. Pastor, I'm okay. After all, I try to be the best I can. I think I'm fine. That's what the rich man thought. He's in hell with no sign of repentance. Jesus said just before he told this parable, he said the law and the prophets were until John. And since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and everyone presses into it. Yeah, everyone wants to get into it, right? And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. He's saying, look, you Pharisees, don't you realize that God has His Word? God's Word will prevail. It's not your traditions and your opinion. You know, Pharisees had an opinion of righteousness. They thought themselves okay. In fact, they thought themselves pretty good. But they weren't listening to God. They weren't applying God's Word. They did this. I think it's okay. So if I think it's okay to do it, it's okay. If I think it's okay not to come to church, it's okay. If I think it's okay to oh, play rules of survival, hey, pastor, don't go there. Well, no, no, hang on. I'm not saying the substance is wrong. All I'm saying is, have you assessed the game by the issue of applying God's word? Or have you just, I think it's okay, so it's okay. Would you pass everything you do under the ambit of a desire to receive and apply God's truth? Is this acceptable to Jesus, my Savior? Where the dividing line is the cross, my ultimate allegiance, where is it? Would I take up my cross daily after Jesus, daily, every day, identify with Him fully in Christ alone and journey towards Jerusalem with Him, towards eternal life? 
this story is a response to people who are like the rich man. Start thinking about your ultimate allegiance. Avoid self-indulgence at the expense of others and reject self-justification based on personal opinion. Jesus didn't put a name. He gave Lazarus a name. He didn't put a name on the rich man. It's almost as if there's an invitation to the Pharisees. Why don't you put your name there? I invite you today to put your name there and stop saying, Pastor, that's not me. Let us pray. Our Father, Luke presents this account as Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. Ultimately, the dividing line is because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Our Father, have mercy upon us who call ourselves your disciples. That would really say discipleship matters. But sometimes we smuggle in another point of self-identity that displays our ultimate allegiance, a self-indulgence with, with transient things that because I think it's okay. Help us to reject the self-justification of the Pharisees who do not apply your word with understanding but just stand on their own opinions of tradition. Father, help us. We are that rich man. And yet I pray for those who sit here who have not been forgiven because they've not been repented, just like the rich man, and they still live life for the passing things of the transient world. And I pray that you will grant it from their heart today.